Believe it or not, I'm on my way to see the burial place of Long John Silver and Peter Pan's Wendy. You'll see what I mean later. I'm on my Royal Enfield in a lonely corner of Bedfordshire, where there's already some of the solitariness of the nearby Cambridgeshire Fens about it. I'm heading for Cockaine Hatley, where Cockaine Hatley Hall was originally established by one Sir John Cockaine in the 14th century. In the 19th century, W. Henley, who was then a well-known poet, he, well, he was a frequent visitor to the hall. He sometimes remembered these days for the poems England My England and Invictus, the latter of these poems containing the famous lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. His ashes, together with his wife's, were buried in the grave of his daughter Margaret, who was buried in the churchyard at Cockin Hackley before them aged only five in 1894. Margaret was the inspiration for Wendy in the story of Peter Pan by J. M. Barry. And that turning on the corner was the track to Cocking Hackley Church. So I'm going to have to make a turn around. And here I am traveling in the opposite direction. There is a track to the left next to this farmhouse but the sign there says bridal way and whilst it leads up to where I'm going I better steer clear of that one I'll head back to the original uh, track I intended to follow at the bend in the road anyway back to uh, Henley who was a friend of J M Barry the story goes that W E Henley used to address Barry as friend turning along this rough track. Henley used to address Barry as friend, which Henley's only daughter mispronounced as Fwend and changed it in a silly childish way to Fwendy Wendy, the latter part of which gave the name of Wendy, a wholly invented name which became popular for girls only following the Peter Pan success in the 1900s, the early 1900s. There is another literary connection. As a young man, Henley suffered from TB of the bone, which resulted in the amputation of a leg. He was treated in Edinburgh by Joseph Lister, the pioneer of antiseptic surgery, where he also met and befriended Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island. just through these uh, gates. Henley had a wooden leg and is claimed to have been Robert Louis Stevenson's model for Long John Silver. And getting to the church means passing through the gateway, which I don't feel comfortable about. It feels like trespassing in someone's garden, albeit a rather large one. The west door of this particular church at Cockaine Hatley was originally used as access for the congregation, with the north door reserved for the residents of the hall. And this is the north door through which, no doubt, W. E. Henley will have passed when he visited the hall, which is over there in the distance behind the trees. The residents, the Cockaines, will have crossed this lawn to the church for centuries. And there's the west door, which was used by the villagers. The tower is in four stages with buttresses and pinnacles, and the pinnacles at the top are 20 feet high, and they were added in the restorations of the early 19th century. There must have been much rebuilding, though, of this church in the 15th century. Those flat top windows are Tudor and probably funded by the Cockaine family, who established the hall shortly before. And there's the monument to Long John Silver, or rather the man who inspired the creation of that famous character, W.E. Henley. And 
here is Peter Pan's Wendy, Henley's young daughter. Also very poignant. What strikes me about this church is the unity of the architecture. Those battlements serve to hold the whole piece together. They are a striking feature on this church. And those apple trees across the lawn, I think some of them might be apple trees, because back in 1929 a John Whitehead purchased the estate and eventually established the largest apple orchard in England, planting Cox's orange pipping trees everywhere. There were a million of them until they were dug up and burned as uneconomic in 1974. Some might have survived around, around the lawn here amidst the other decorative trees. There's the hall again. I didn't like going up to the hall but nevertheless there it is in the camera. It just felt too intrusive. So one last look at the hall. Cockane Hatley Hall. Or it's back to the bike. Starting up with as little throttle as possible. down the driveway and through the gate and along the rough track through the fields a moment's pause to consult the map I'm looking for a route to the village of Sutton. Whilst out this way, I thought I'd take a look at another local landmark of a very different kind, even though it might have been built when the foundations of Cockaine Hatley's church were being laid. means riding once more across these open Bedfordshire claylands. And by the magic of editing, here I am riding through Sutton Village. And here is the landmark that I came to see. In the middle of Sutton, between the church and the main village, the Sutton Pack Horse Bridge. It was a small two arch construction crafted from local sandstone. It must have been sometime in the late 13th or early 14th century. I'll cross the ford and park up and take a look around. taking a walk in the footsteps of those medieval pack horse drivers, complete with thumb for company. 
Only for a short while, I promise. Ah, the friction rustle of motorcycle trousers and the thump of heavy boots. And here's a view of the brook and the ford from the top of this medieval pack horse bridge. Beautiful, sunny, pleasant, very early spring day. The leaves not quite yet out on the trees. The bridge can be dated largely by the pointed shape of its arches. Stone bridges at this time were always built with semicircular arches. It's believed to be the only surviving bridge of its type in Bedfordshire, or a Frankfurt Harbour in the whole England. Originally, only pedestrians and pack horses had the right of way, but over time, I don't know when, this right was extended to include cyclists. The bridge was part of one of the most frequented pack horse routes from north to south and south to north and was also situated on an important trade route to the wool towns such as Dunstan and Bedford. And you might wonder why such a shallow ford, ford needed such a relatively elaborate bridge. Well you only need to look back to this same scene in the winter of late 2020 and the flooding of the brook across the bridge, and there can't have been that much traffic over the bridge in the Middle Ages. Nevertheless, there is a pedestrian refuge, just in case a serf found himself stranded halfway as the pack horses passed over. It is, of course, over the cut water in the middle of the bridge. So, to continue my crossing, just as those pack horses did hundreds of years ago. And it's one last look at a piece of transport history. It's time to return to the bike and leave this delightful corner of Bedfordshire. Which means one last ride through the ford and past that ancient pack horse bridge. now I'm done